Tennessee this week from WATE 6 on your side starts now. Hello and welcome to Tennessee This Week. I'm Don Hudson. It was certainly a week filled with shakeups, both on the state and national level. Perhaps the biggest political earthquake happened just down the road in Nashville as the former Speaker of the Tennessee House and his one-time top aide were arrested on federal charges claiming that they took part in a bribery and kickback conspiracy. State Representative Glenn Cassida and C Cade Cothran left federal court, as you see right here, after entering not guilty pleas. It's a 20 count indictment with charges ranging from conspiracy to steal from federally supported programs to wire fraud to money laundering conspiracy as well. Prosecutors laid out their theory of the alleged scheme with Cothran setting up a company to send mailers to lawmakers' constituents. State lawmakers get public money for that purpose. U.S. attorneys claim that Cassida and other unnamed lawmakers used their positions to get the company approved as a vendor. That company, Phoenix Solutions, was supposedly run by a person named Matthew Phoenix. But prosecutors say Matthew Phoenix was actually Cothran. Prosecutors claim that Cassida and other lawmakers knew as much and hid Cothran's involvement when touting the company to other lawmakers, and they hid that he was actually kicking back some of the company's profits to them. Also, the trio, according to prosecutors, hid their involvement by sending the state invoices in the name of political consulting companies owned by the lawmakers. In January 2021, federal agents searched Cassidy's uh, office and his home, plus those of several fellow lawmakers. Tuesday, state capitol reporter Chris O'Brien spoke one-on-one -on -one with several leaders about this news. It's just very sad to see any legislator's career be uh, a tarnies are, are in this way, and I know he's going to have an uphill battle defending himself. To others, anger. I think our families deserve better from our elected officials. Laws should pass because um, they prevailed in honest debates on the merits of their legislation, not because lawmakers got a kickback. Both Democrats and Republicans alike came together to condemn outgoing Rep. Glenn Cassida and his chief of staff, Kate Cothran. This is a, a sad day for the state of Tennessee government right now. It definitely puts a black eye on the legislature as a whole. It's sad, and he is a friend, and he's a friend to many people in the legislature and in his home county of Williamson County. He's represented Williamson County very well over the years. Senator Joey Hensley worked with Cassida when he was still in the State House of Representatives. He wasn't the only Republican with something to say. State Speaker Cameron Sexton released a statement saying, quote, in Tennessee, we will not tolerate public corruption, defrauding our state, or bribery at any level. He went on to say today is a good day for Tennesseans because we did not turn a blind eye on these criminal activities. The governor's office released its own statement saying, we trust the legal process and continue to hold Tennessee's public servants to high standards of accountability. In Nashville, Chris O'Brien. Cassida resigned from his leadership role in the House in August 2019 during a scandal that involved racist and sexist text messages in exchange with Cothran. At that point, his colleagues in the House had already voted no confidence in his leadership. Thursday, we heard from Tennessee Governor Bill Lee calling the case unfortunate. It's really important that, that the people trust elected officials that, um, that are public servants. It's really important. And when there's a breach of that trust, it's a, uh, it's very, it's more than unfortunate. It's a, it's, it should not happen in our state. Yeah, the two are scheduled to go on trial in October. Both Cassidy and Cothran facing up to 20 years in prison. Right out of Washington came the massive change that President Biden announced he would wipe out 10 to 20 thousand dollars of student debt for millions of Americans. It was fulfilling a campaign promise for Biden and eagerly sought by countless Americans struggling to pay off college loans. But critics charge it amounts to buying votes for Democrats heading into the midterms, cheating financially responsible Americans and ballooning the national debt by maybe $300 billion. Later in the week, the National Taxpayers Foundation estimated the debt forgiveness plan could cost every U.S. taxpayer $2,500. Well, Friday, I had a chance to hear from Tennessee's junior senator, Bill Haggerty. He says in addition to financial costs, there will be a political price to pay. I think it's, uh, it cuts against the heart and soul of America when you do something as unfair as this. I think about when I graduated high school, most of the kids did not go to college. Why should they subsidize the kid that did? I actually took out a student loan. I went to college. I changed my stars. 
I was happy to pay that loan back. I paid it back early. Everyone that paid their loan back, everybody that didn't take out a loan and worked their way through college, and the rest of us that don't go to college, feel like suckers right now. Because Joe Biden has gone on a blatant vote-buying expedition. It's going to cost every family in America, I heard, $2,000 to support this vote-buying operation that Joe Biden has put through. It cuts against the sense of fairness that Americans hold dear. This is not going to go well for the Biden administration. I think that the public is going to speak loud and clear in November when they go to the polls. Obviously, some people say it was to get votes and to fulfill a campaign promise. But do you think that it, that actually will go against them come come November? I do think it's going to go against uh, Joe Biden in November. I think it's going to go against the Democrat Party in November. Because again, Americans believe in fairness. And what's fair about having one category of people, you know, the elite, so to speak, being subsidized to the tune of $10,000 each, while other hardworking Americans, hardworking Tennesseans, are footing the bill. I don't think this is going to play well at all for the Democrat Party. It won't play well for Joe Biden, and we're going to see the results in November. We shall see about that. Now, Haggerty was here in Knoxville as part of his annual economic tour, and we had a chance to also ask him about the CHIPS bill that he helped shepherd through the Senate last month. It passed with bipartisan support. While not all his Republican colleagues were on board for Haggerty, it's about taking any step necessary to support businesses and keep U.S. businesses competitive on the global market. I picked up the phone and I called CEOs of chip manufacturing companies around the world. They told me it takes five to six years just to permit a semiconductor chip fabrication facility here in America. When I asked why, these facilities are huge. They can be up to $50 billion in expenditures. They use a lot of water, a lot of electricity, a lot of chemicals, which require a tremendous number of federal permits. Those permits take five to six years. Given the rate of technology development in the semiconductor energy industry, it doesn't make sense. That's why they're producing them all in China, in Taiwan, in Europe. So I said, what can we do to get that manufacturing back here? I put together legislation that compresses that five to six year timeline down to 18 months. Semiconductor manufacturers told me that makes America competitive again. That legislation passed through a Democrat controlled Senate, through a Democrat controlled House, and Joe Biden just signed it last week. So I'm delighted to see this happen. This is the type of business solution that you want to see, a common sense solution to fix a real problem. Does it cost the taxpayers anything? No. Do the bureaucrats like it? Not at all. But what it does is it makes America competitive again. As tensions between the U.S. and China rise over Taiwan, Tennessee Senator Marsha Blackburn visited the Taiwanese capital city as a signal of support. One thing that is very clear is that the threat from the CCP is real. This is something that the individuals in this, this region feel as if they are on the front line when it comes to dealing with the CCP. Blackburn continued her criticism of China on social media, writing, quote, the Chinese Communist Party will stop at nothing to achieve global domination and destroy Taiwan's independence. Meanwhile, Senator Hagerty, uh, Hagerty excuse me, commended his colleagues, saying this sort of visit to Taiwan is really part of her job, and he's praising Blackburn's stance on China. You know what? You can't intimidate Marsha Blackburn. She does not care what the Chinese Communist Party has to say. She's going to go where she wants to go, and I think that's exactly right. The Chinese Communist Party cannot dictate where a U.S. Senator travels, and I'm delighted to see her there. All right, still to come, we're going to talk about those issues, plus the state's abortion law going into effect after the downfall of Roe versus Wade. Our panel of pundits is coming up next. You're watching Tennessee This Week on WAT6 on your side. And welcome back to Tennessee This Week. We are now joined by our panel of political pundits, Courtney Piper, political contributor, George Corda, a political analyst, Craig Griffith, our health care analyst as well. Uh, several topics we want to get into, and we'll see how far we can get into them, but we want to start with student loan forgiveness. I'm curious, and it doesn't matter which order you want to go in and here, is this a fair deal, a good deal, good for America, bad for America? What are your there's no there's there's no forgiveness involved in this in this action. It is transference. It is transference of debt from people who obligated themselves to it for their own benefit to achieve their own goals has now been transferred to the taxpayers, which I might add in effect wipes out every dollar of the alleged savings that was going to come out out of the non-inflation inflation reduction act that passed a couple of weeks ago right. so we're right back where we were and so we've got a 
a, a situation here in which people across the country are being told under a COVID emergency, this is, this is being done under a COVID emergency at the same time the CDC is relaxing requirements and the federal government wanted to end Title 42 on the southern border, we're now told COVID is such an emergency that two months before an election, all of this forgiveness, meaning debt transference, is going to be done for a certain group of people. And what I think has happened here, I can't imagine who in the White House thought this was a politically smart idea. I was watching today on MSNBC and CNN, which are usually not terribly critical. They were, they had commentators on there to the left of center pounding this thing because of the way it's, re, it's the reaction with respect to individuals who, who didn't go to college and are now assuming the responsibility of debt for people whose families make up to 100, up, who make up to 125,000 or 250,000 as a family. This is a bizarre yeah. political act. Yeah. George, have you ever had student loan debts? Student no. loans? Okay. No. So and I did. I did. I've had a mortgage. Yeah. I've had a car payment. I've had a okay. okay. Uh, well, that's like Courtney. Uh, hey. like Courtney. Like Courtney. George, those loan products are extraordinarily different from a student loan because they are federally regulated. Student loans, their interest rates are not federally regulated. And with this program, we're not talking about wiping out somebody's six-figure debt. We are talking about taking ten to twenty thousand dollars off of their tab, depending on what kind of loan they have. And if you're angry about this, you should be, because the entire student loan program needs to be totally overhauled. It is possible that age 30, if you pay your debt payment, your student loan payment for 10 years, when you turn 40, you will actually owe more money than you did when you were 30. And that's your problem. No, it's not that's your not problem. That's not the problem of every American taxpayer. It is not, George. It's if you if your let's say your payment is something like four hundred dollars a month, and you make that four hundred dollar a month payment for ten years, you will owe more at the end of ten years than when you started that that year that one. That doesn't year mean end. the American taxpayer has to shoulder the burden. Right. George, it's a huge problem, and people pay you know double, triple, quadruple the principal that they actually took out. And this does so not to change paid, that. This does nothing to change Listen, the problem we're talking if this about. is making you mad, it should, because we need to restructure how student -led loan programs crazy. are run and their interest rates. Well, you, the two of you are a perfect example. To my next question, and you can also add your opinion as well, is this going to help politically later down the road, or is this going to hurt politically, or is it going to end up being a wash? Well, according to the New York Times, this is directed straight at the middle class, the people that receive Pell Grants and things like that. So, I mean, politically speaking, it could be an advantage to the, to the Democrats running. But as a, as a person, you know, we pay every quarter the, the tuition for our uh, children's college educations. Kind of makes me a little upset uh, that uh, now, you know, maybe we should have waited, gotten a loan that was forgiven. But that's neither here nor there. Craig, of course, it's federal, it's it's federal money that these dollars. people are borrowing. And now the federal government's just simply... So I, I, you know, it's going to be three hundred three hundred billion more. We can argue about is there that three hundred billion anywhere to be found in the federal government? Uh, so it's a, it's to me, it was a campaign promise that Joe Biden had, and and he followed uh, through on it. And and you know, elections have consequences, and this is one thing that he wanted to get done. There's well, going to be the only listen as the only person who had student loans, I believe, on this entire pundit panel. I can tell you, just because it was difficult for me to pay back those student loans, I don't think it should be difficult for somebody else to pay back loans when they end up owing more than they actually uh, and started out the with. the law. Don't put it on me and Craig and They're everybody not, George, watching this show. It it's you. already on we're you, George. On These you. loans are from the federal government. Right. Yeah, let's move forward from that. Does it does the system need to change? Because a lot of times these checks are being written individuals and then not always used for 
you know, for school because they can use it for anything when it's written to them. And then, of course, they go maybe get a degree in something that's never going to be able to allow them to pay the back. Do we need to change? Right. What's done is done probably, except there's a legal challenge. We'll see. But do we need to change the, sis the system the of student loans? Yes, Glenn, Glenn absolutely. Reynolds, who is a uh, distinguished a beach program distinguished law professor at the University of Tennessee and who has written a number of books, has written one on this subject. It's called the higher education bubble. And what Glenn has pointed out multiple times is that this explosion in college costs isn't because faculty is increasing, isn't because instruction is increasing, it's because the administrations are doubling and tripling in size with all of these ancillary offices and vice deputy chancellors for this, that, and the other all over the country. And so he's written about this bubble and its effect, and he's saying a lot of people are getting degrees that are not worth what they're paying for. Right. Well, uh, and that's that's very true. I mean, we, we've seen the impact of this really burdensome administrative structure on the cost, and there's very little cost containment. But but the state governments have reduced the amount of money that they put toward higher education, and so the, that that difference has to be made up somewhere. So they're making it up with uh, higher uh, tuition costs. So yes, the system needs to be changed all the way from reviewing how much a college education costs to the administration of the student loans. I, I remember I was sitting in a, a committee meeting in Nashville once where the committee members were wanting the uh, UT law school to put in their brochures how how much they can expect to pay be paid after their graduation and what are their chances of getting a job so uh, this is this is on people's radars uh, where what this uh, these loans are getting you and and of course, we've heard for years about these loans straddling the uh, uh, young people. They couldn't buy houses, right. uh, couldn't start a family. So it'll be interesting to see if this money is put into productive use instead of paying the federal government back. Hey, Courtney, I'm going to give you the last word on this uh, on this subject if you wanted to jump in there on how maybe we can reform it, especially as someone who had student loans. The whole student loan program needs to be reformed. The interest rates need to be federally regulated, just like any other loan product. For example, you know, student the student loan interest rate right now is higher than my mortgage payment. It's higher than my credit card interest rate. Why is that a thing? Why is that why is that even possible? So the entire system definitely needs to be overhauled. And if you're upset about this ten to twenty thousand dollar forgiveness, you should be because it's indicative of a larger problem that needs to be addressed. I want to get into uh, the, really the biggest news in Tennessee this week: the Human Life Protection Act, or as a lot of people call it, the abortion trigger law, went into effect. Um, I'm I'm interested in does it change? Next time the legislature gets together with the wording, because there's been a lot of talk, a lot of debate, and a lot of misunderstanding of are there any exceptions or are there no exceptions, and will that be addressed? Should it be addressed? Well, it's a, like a great many other laws. They're passed. Then all of a sudden you get into it, you find out, oh, this was an unintended consequence, or this wasn't thought through, or what do we do in this situation? It happens with a lot of laws. And I agree with Senator Richard Briggs, who said that when the legislature gets back together in January, they'll make some modifications. What those are, I wouldn't hazard to guess, but there will be an attempt, at least, to make some modifications in terms of what is being requested, either by physicians or interest groups or whatever. And it may indeed change. But this, the fact that you pass a law and then later on have to come back and do more stuff to it is not unusual. Well, all these exceptions and considerations were brought up when the law was passed, that there was no exception for rape and incest. And the, the, whole, the whole issue that we're getting into now is that uh, if, a, if a doctor performs an abortion that, to save the life of, of the woman, uh, there is not a protection for him until he's indicted, prosecuted, and comes to trial, uh, a lengthy, expensive process mm -hmm. Um, uh, where he can defend himself, saying that this was necessary to save the life of the of the mother. So uh, this is really going to have a chilling effect, I think, uh, between you know the doctors and the women's uh, women, and will uh, it's going to be a difficult process to iron out with the current fever for no exceptions. These exceptions were uh, brought up during the initial legislative phase, and I don't. 
under think that there is a way that they would pass now. This attitude toward, the, you know, this lax attitude that some of our elected officials have about, oh, well, you know, we'll make changes to it in January. It, it completely underscores the lack of respect that they have for the women and the medical professionals that are going to have to deal with this. Lives and livelihoods are at stake. There is no exception for rape. There is no exception for incest. And there is no exception for the life of the mother. Republicans for a very long time have been spinning this narrative that women use abortions for the sole purpose of birth control. And that narrative is about to unravel and it will have real, real consequences. It will have real consequences for women. It will have real consequences for the medical profession. And it will have election consequences as well. There was a poll that came out right before Roe was overturned and the vast majority of Tennesseans agreed that abortion should be legal in some or all cases. So this is going to get suburban women in particular motivated to go to the polls and there will be consequences. This week we had all the news, don't need to get into the names of people getting facing federal charges, 20 federal charges I believe, not the first time people down there have been in trouble. It's obviously a bad look for the state legislature. Does there need to be a major change down there? Uh, is this going to have people's trust, break people's trust with the legislature? And, and what can be done, what should be done? Well, every every 20 years or so, you have this. You have uh, the Tennessee Waltz, uh, Operation Rocky Top, and, and now this. I think that there's so much money in the system now, people are trying to game it to their advantage, to their profit. And, it, and until you take some of the money out of the system, then there's always going to be those who are elected who see an opportunity to to make money, and and a lot of it is uh, internal. These they're rotating the money around amongst themselves. You know, you have a fund where you can make uh, 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 constituent mailers. Well, I'll re well, I'll go ahead and print those and mail them for you. So the money just keeps circling circling around. And there's there's so much money in the system. There's so much money for profit. Some people are going to be tempted and and fall prey to to doing unethical things. I worked for three years on Capitol Hill in a spokesman's role for state government, and it is a it is an odd type of environment because it's almost a universe unto itself, kind of a closed universe in a way, and. You can see people begin to decide that they are, they're different. They can do stuff. And if they do stuff, they can get out of it. Or they have the latitude to do it because they're important, powerful people. And they can say things to this intern or they can make this deal with this other person. And it'll all work out okay because of who they are. And the, the, there are two things that will destroy a politician faster than anything, money and arrogance. And both of those are usually at the root of these legislative problems. They certainly were in this case with Cassida. <laughs> he was not well loved in the legislature. You didn't see many people stand up and support him and through his arrogance. And so that's exactly what happened this, this round. Yeah, power corrupts. When you're making the laws, I suppose some people have this ten tendency to think they're above the law. So, you know, we will most likely continue to see this, not in, you know, Tennessee state politics, but all across the country, state, local, federal, power can corrupt. And when you're making the laws, some people think they're above the law. Yeah, I, th I think, don't you think that some people go down there with all the good intentions and they get surrounded by the mahogany and the marble and the granite and the, the uh, ring kissing and then they change? Well, that, that's, that's a good point you're making there. And, and, that, and that's the way it is. I mean, you might be back in your hometown, you might run a hardware store right. or you might, you know, do something fairly typical. Right. You get to Nashville, it's yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Whatever you want, you tell me what you need. You, I'll get it for you. And and the, one of the, the worst things that can happen to an elected official is having people tell them they can have what they want all the time. Well, in, in, this, in this case, it, you know, you, what we need are very strong leaders in the leadership position that can mm -hmm. need to convey to people from day one of the legislature that, you know, they won't tolerate this. But unfortunately, for, in this case, 
one of the conspirators was a House leader. Well, that's going to wrap up that topic, and we're going to wrap up the show. We want to thank our panel for being here and for giving us their time, and thank you for watching Tennessee This Week. We'll see you back here at this time next week. The views of guests on Tennessee This Week are their own.